This video is brought to you by Bitbox NES Game Cases. There's no better way to protect, store, and display your NES game collection. Only available at stoneagegamer.com forward slash bitbox. What's going on gamers? This is John with Games31.com. Uh, this video is going to be another top 10 video. And I reached out to my good friend Mike and he and I kind of talked about what would be a fun and interesting top 10 video that a lot of people haven't talked about. Uh, awesome, awesome show. They've got some great series. They, uh, they have, one of them is called Living 8-Bits, so multiple productions that they put on. Uh, Living 8-Bits is a video game related series where they take video game situations from retro age, like from the NES for example, and they apply it to real life. It's hilarious, high production value, very creative, great team over there. Encourage you guys to go over, check out them out, subscribe to them, show some support. But anyway, we talked to Mike, and him and I were kind of talking about an interesting top 10. And we came up with, uh, we are talking about multiplayer. And when you think of multiplayer today in gaming, you think online, right? You think of playing Call of Duty online, or you think of, when, when multiplayer comes into the minds of gamers today, you think of online. But back when I was growing up, and many of us that are, you know, 20 plus years old, will remember that multiplayer used to be local multiplayer. There was no online, right? So we decided to do a top 10 local multiplayer games. This is a really tough list, guys. I really encourage you guys to uh, comment. Let me know what you guys think about it. Uh, and uh, they hope you guys enjoy. Number 10. Me and my, my neighbor used to spend a lot of time playing this game. Uh, with THQ, Aki Man, all those guys. But what was really memorable about this game was, for us, we used to do uh, the group parties. And we'd all get together. And we actually got to the point where we had a commissioner. We had a guy who would come out and he would, if he won so many matches or whoever was the most dominant guy, he would be a commissioner. When I think of NWO versus WCW uh, for video games, I right away go to the N64. I mean, you had World Tour, which was the first one, came out in 97. You had Revenge, came out a year later, 98. This is the time when they ruled Monday nights. My buddies and I would watch this Monday nights, uh, excited for every match, and then after that, we'd go and play it. Uh, on the N64, we'd have drinking parties. It was a great time playing this. I love the grappling effect. I think the controls is really what makes this game. I love the whole battle royale aspect of it too because you'd have all these wrestlers in one match. It was crazy, all four of us would play at the same time. I guess I should start with WCW NWO World Tour. That was the first. They eventually made four of them, very similar games. Two WCW ones, two WWE ones, WWF at the time. It made THQ a household name. And it was on Nintendo 64, so you could play with three friends. And it was fun to play. They came up with a way to get a ton of moves in the game with the control scheme. It was practically perfect. Number nine. The only thing I remember about that game is just watching other people play it and all the cool uh, phrases like the, uh, he's on fire. Boom shakalaka. I remember those. NBA Jam was the jam for the arcades. Who would have thought that sports title would have translated so well to the arcades? NBA Jam was amazing. I'd always, people would always think I was insane because I would pick the rookie team. But if you, if you hit the change players options like 30 times, there was just one guy who was awesome at three pointers. And I surprised a lot of people going up against Scottie Pippen and all them. And uh, I won a lot of games in one game. I won that game. I was down by two with like seconds left and I hit, or I was down by like nine, but there was one of those things on the floor where it's like multiple points, so if you make it, and it was back by my foul one. Put it up and it went all the way. Shot clock ended, and, but that game that I played, you could, it didn't matter if the shot clock ended or the game clock ended, it was at the end of the game. Boom, I win, right? Before it could even register, he comes, jumps up and boom, punches the Genesis and turns it off. And I'm like, I still won. I played the arcades all the time, four player particularly. I mean, this was awesome to play four player. I was blown away at the graphics. They actually put the picture faces of the actual athletes on, on the players, so it actually looked like you're playing them. NBA Jam, all right. There's a lot of stories that I have about this one, but there's one in particular. I used to work in a, at an amusement park, and, um, and me and, and my coworker, his name was Isaiah, we used to play NBA Jam. We, you know, you weren't allowed, you were an employee. We were the supervisors, and we weren't allowed to play this game. So it was, Isaiah and I would alternate, like, you know, one of us would be sitting there, like, looking out the front of the arcade, you know, just kind of pretending like we were looking for our boss, you know, or, but, you know, we're watching everybody inside. And we had a signal, like, if we saw the boss coming, because you could see all the way across the park, you know, and I'd go running back, yo, Isaiah, and he'd quick turn off the game real fast or hand it over to a little kid. We ended up 
competing over time, like who could have the most, you know, wins and whatever. Like we, we turn off the game, you know, we knew where you turn off the game and everything. I think probably, I mean, I'm not a basketball fan, but it made me enjoy playing a basketball game mainly because um, the, the, it was just so cartoonish and fun, but really it was all about the announcer um, and, and, and the catchphrases. Uh, you, you would just try to get the, him to say the random things. Shamalama ding dong, and um, he's on fire, whatever. When NBA Jam actually hit the home console for the Genesis and Super Nintendo, definitely prefer the Super Nintendo just because the controller was laid out a little better to play it. My brother and I would play this game all the time, two player. We'd play on the same team because you had an option to play either on the same team or separate teams, right? But we'd play on the same team. We were the Seattle Supersonics. That's right. Growing up in Seattle, I was a huge Supersonics fan. Oklahoma City. Screw you for stealing our team. NBA Jam. I guess we all first heard of this in the arcades. But then it made its way over to Sega and Super Nintendo. And it was just as fun to play. Man, those catchphrases, I think, you still catch yourself saying. Boom shakalaka. I mean, and there was fun stuff to do. Like you could play as Bill Clinton and Big Head Mode. Oh, oh, shit. <laughs> Number eight. So I don't have much experience with Street Fighter. Um, I've, I've always been more of a Mortal Kombat guy, but I've been playing some Street Fighter recently. Um, they're both like so cool. Just like, they're, they're similar in tone, but like they're different. Like Mortal Kombat, it's much more, you know, darker, grittier, bloodier, and that's what really adds to the, you know, the charm of it, if you will. And then Street Fighter, it's a little more bright, colorful. Um, but the cool thing is just all the characters, all the moves, all the dynamics. It's all, it's all cool to see these, you know, different looking people in both games start beating the heck out of each other and all the different moves and the skill sets based on the person. It's, it's really cool. Well, my, my favorite, I mean, in Street Fighter, there's only two girl characters, but I loved Chung li and then when they made Cammy, I really loved her too. Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat, you certainly had to be categorized in the same category here because they came out during the same time. They're both fantastic fighting games in their own right. It's like Apple's and Origins. They're, they're both great, <laughs> okay? But it kind of depends on the console you're playing them on, to be honest with you, because for me, personally, uh, when it came to Street Fighter 2, it had to be the Super Nintendo because you had the L and R bumpers. It made it so much easier to control. Uh, also, Super Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo is a fantastic port. When it came to Mortal Kombat, I had to go with the Genesis because the blood was there. And that was the, that's the, what really sets Mortal Kombat apart, was the blood and the fatalities. Oh. Which Street Fighter 2? I mean, there was like three of them. There was, wasn't there Street Fighter Turbo, Street Fighter Ultra, right? And Street Fighter Super? They were all like Street Fighter 2, but they had different like spin-offs, right? Right, yeah, I, yeah. And Ponner is over there and you can't see him, but he's over there and just kind of nodding, you know. Um, that was another game. Uh, again, we're going back to the arcade. We had that in the arcade, and kids were just playing that and just, like just constantly throwing money into that machine. I used to laugh. Again, I had that for Super Nintendo. But when I first started, I would always go over a friend's house that had it, and we'd always play it. And we were always so amazed, like, "Oh man, it's like the future! It's like those video games, virtual reality!" Because they used the actual actors' motion capture, and they used their images too, so it looked like a real person. They should do that more. Street Fighter 2 slash Mortal Kombat. It makes sense we group them together because they are amazing. I liked Mortal Kombat more. See, that's, that's tough to say because they're both amazing. But the blood code, what was, what was up with that? It was Abacab, A-B-A-C-A-B-B. -B -B. I still remember it. I guess that was some sort of way to pretend censorship, but I don't know anyone who had the game and didn't put in the blood code. Doesn't make any sense. Both of these fighting games are so fun to play with someone in the same room, right? Because then you can actually talk garbage to them. <laughs> and without being online and talking garbage, you can just talk to garbage to them uh, next to you. Especially in the arcades, these games are so much fun to play uh, someone against. And you, always, I always am getting some guy who's super good. Now, I played a Scorpion on Mortal Kombat. My player choice on Street Fighter 2 was Ryu. But um, I always get my ass whooped whenever I play in arcades. If there's someone who's been there, you can tell if someone's been there a while. You know, they'll start losing some matches, and all of a sudden, boom, they'll turn it on and they'll, they'll blow you away. So, uh, fortunately, I never bet any games <laughs> in the arcades, but man, I definitely, if I did, I would have lost a lot of money. A good reason why they're paired together because they were both, it, you had one or the other. And I think it was brought down whether you had the Super Nintendo 
or the Genesis. Now in my case, I had the Genesis. So the game to play on that was Mortal Kombat, mainly because the blood code, the Super Nintendo uh, omitted the blood and the fatalities and pretty much everything that made that game so uh, appealing for incredibly immature young boys. I could never get the finishing moves right. So like the get over here or the uppercut, that was always my finishing move. But the only one I could ever do the finishing move was Liu Kang in Mortal Kombat 2 with the dragon. And I thought that was the most badass thing ever. So I was always Liu Kang. Number seven. Contra is one of the best running gun shooters on the NES. And a lot of people may forget that actually initially it was an arcade game by Konami. But this is definitely, when I think Contra, I think NES, come on, right? And playing two player made it so much more fun. Especially the jungle theme, where you're actually jumping up like that. You know, you're jumping up different platforms. It's so easy to die and lose track of your partner. That, that was kind of a frustrating thing, but it kind of made it an interesting playing dynamic as well. It made it a completely different playing experience playing two player than single player. So Contra was awesome as a multiplayer game because even though it was only two player, even though it was only the 8-bit era before four player became really huge, um, it was the most fun I've had playing a two player game um, on the 8-bit Nintendo. The fact that the game was ridiculously hard playing with three lives, so I could only get to like stage two or three at best with that, but it didn't matter. You had the Konami code, you could cheat. Just let me play a game with guns, and I was a little kid. After that, it turned into like watching Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, and it just warped my mind. And now I'm this way. But I could never get past the first level of Contra, and every time I did, it was amazing. So I felt like I just beat the game. So when I beat the first level, it was just, all right, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going outside. Contra. Contra. Uh, you gotta love Contra. Um, Contra is such a fun game. Now, me personally, I was terrible when playing in the co-op. Um, but it was one of those early games where you got to... It was one of those early two-player games on the NES where you got to actually play simultaneously with a friend. One of the all-time greatest. Another code you can't forget, the Konami code. But you needed to put select in there to get the two players. 30 lives. It's awesome. Um, when you play with a friend, you needed to be... You needed to work together. When you play with a friend, you needed to work as a team. Because... There were some levels, especially vertically scrolling, jumping levels, where if your partner went too fast, then the guy left behind would die. And that was it. And you could lose a ton of lives that way. So, finesse is the way to go, and a partner who's understanding. You're on the same page. I was one of those few um, people that was actually able to beat the game without using the code. But I could only beat it solo. I could. I actually have never beaten the game co-op because the other guy would screw me up. Number six. NHL '96 is one of the best hockey games. I think. Uh, you know, I love '94, '95, and the other ones during this time. They're all great games too. But '96 had a new fighting dynamic. Uh, they had a lot of cool things. I love playing tournament mode. So one of my favorite things about playing two-player, though, were the cheap shots. So even after the play is called dead, you can still have a couple seconds to throw in an extra like uh, check or, or whatnot and knock your, the other player over. It was so much fun doing that and subsequently pissing off the, the person you're playing as well in doing so. NHL 96, who was on the cover? Uh, is, that, is that bad? That's how I classify who? Is I that, think like it was that the one with the goalie. Oh, oh yep, okay. And it, uh, that was the Legion of Doom years. Yeah, and it, didn't it have that, like... It was the first one to, to use an actual song, too, right? I'm not sure what I know that. I, I remember, yeah. How many stories do I have playing the game? Thank you for asking. I've got a million. My friend and I, we were so obsessed with rosters that we would take every player, and we, we knew about them, too, because we read everything when we were younger. We would uh, put every player on the right roster, no matter what. Even if it was exceeded, we'd drop the worst guy off the roster. Whenever we dropped a guy off the roster, we put him on Edmonton, because screw Edmonton, they had enough cup in the 80s. Cups in the 80s, you know what I mean? You get Gretzky, now you're getting the bad players. But we would create, create ourselves. So I would always be number 96 center for the Flyers, always. And Scotty would always be number 31 or 34. I think it was 31, I think. He would always be 31 as the goalie. And one time we're playing NHL 96, Flyers home versus Flyers away, so you have the exact same players, no line changes. Um, this end and this end, goalie. So Scotty, he's goalie here, he's away goalie here. I will never forget this in my life ever to this day, and I'm glad I can now finally put this on the internet because I want to rub it in his face. 
Me, right? I'm the goalie. I passed, I'm the home goalie. I passed the puck, right? Up, up the middle of the ice to my center. No one's there though. So what's it do? Hit center ice and just goes down to the goalie. So it's like, oh, well, I guess I just passed to the other goalie. No, no. Other, other Scott goalie in NHL 96 does this weird false split thing. Goes right, right between his five holes. So my, my Scott goalie scored Hextall on other Scott goalie. And I'm like, dude, you're awesome, but you suck so bad. Man, those are the golden years for hockey games, in my opinion. 94, 95, 96, they just kept getting better. 96 was amazing. Oh, man. Pavel Bure, that's all I have to say. NHL 96, um, I think the, the, one of the most awesome aspects of the Genesis was its sports games. Um, it had some of the best sports games I think you could find. Um, World Series Baseball, uh, the 1993 edition, um, being a Philadelphia fan, it was awesome. But what made NHL 96 so great was not only you could select your, or create your own players for your favorite team, but as a Philadelphia Flyers fan, um, it was awesome because that was like the Legion of Doom years, where it was Lindros, LeClaire, um, and it was just, it, it's just so much fun. The only way to play the game, though, in multiplayer is to turn penalties off. Um, because then you could just go out and, and, and have so much fun. But that, that, was, that was probably one of my favorite games. That's really what, one of the games that got me into, you know, hockey. And of course, you know, you watch, you start playing the game and you start liking the team that you're playing with. And, you know, I'm a Flyers fan and I used to play with like the Blackhawks, which, sorry, you know, I, I know it's just blasphemy now. But, you know, I'm still a Flyers fan and now I, I have to play with the Flyers every time I play that game. Well, guys, that completes part one over the top 10 best local multiplayer games of all time. I'll put a link to part two here. You guys can check that out as well. That'll be numbers five through one. If you guys want to stay in touch, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I now recently joined Instagram as well, as well as my website, gamesradio1.com. I'll provide links below. Thanks for watching, guys. Happy gaming. Take care.